the interactive user is mostly dependent upon page cache. Now this morning I was having trouble just using VI. And then I went into crash and looked at the VI. Actually, I dropped to KDB and looked at the VI. And again, it was the VI was stuck on the slab, not on the page cache. So this is where the crash command or the kernel stack traces can be handy. Again, a process is either running, runnable, or sleeping. And I'm using the WCHAN and the kernel stack traces to look at the sleeping situation. Am I sleeping on NFS? Am I sleeping on uh, this or that? And to look at system time, I'm using perf top, assuming it doesn't hang my system. Anyway, I'm going to move on here. So uh, solve your disk problems first. If I've got a bad, if I've got poorly designed disks that aren't properly distributing my I/O, I'm going to back up into the cache. Now, I've had cases where the cache was well behaved, but the the disks were bad, but the cache was covering up and hiding it. So I could look at the cache statistics and see uh, everything that we're reading is being found in cache, everything looked healthy, the logic was high, the physicals were low. But then when you looked at the disk, the disks were busy. And I've had other cases where the cache was poorly behaved because of cache thrash effects, but the disk drives were healthy. But I always try to take care of the file system first. My, uh, Metaphor here, a cache is like a public swimming pool. Anybody can do what they want in the water. And if I start writing a 100 gig file on the system, assuming I had disk space for it, you all are going to feel the impact of that. Again, cache by default can take all the memory. Dirty can only take 50%. Now, when I say dirty, that includes the write back in the NFS unstable. And we now have a page cache limit MB to avoid the cache getting too big. I don't want to have to do a trim on it. Now, this is where I have a problem with my system. I don't have a big enough file system to load up memory with page cache. I was trying to do that this morning, get all my memory to be cached disk data. Again, lower dirty ratio and keep the flush ahead of the writes. If I have a real high dirty ratio, I'm going to get too much dirty data, and then I'm going to start having contention on the flushing. A very common uh, recommendation is to drop dirty background ratio to 5, the lowest it can go, and drop dirty ratio to a 10. But the dirties are now available in bytes, and it's one or the other. If I set dirty ratio bytes, the dirty ratio becomes ignored. We were seeing this, the slab can take all of memory. Again, BC Free can release the cache, and freeing memory may use memhog to get a node aware trim. Flush is what writes dirty data to disk, and remember the flush has major minor numbers after it. Flush chokes are when the prior flush is not done yet, and dropping in our requests can help throttle these flush chokes. Now our default for NR requests, this is the number of uh, I.O. operations in the elevator, uh, our setting is 128. IOPS in the elevator, if you look at that IBM Red Book on uh, Linux tuning, they're actually, for Oracle in that scenario, they're dropping it to 64. But I don't know of anybody adjusting in our requests except me playing with it. Again, you can always add more memory, but that's, not, that's a never-ending return. All memory will always be used, no ceiling by default. So recommending you set one so you don't have to manage it. I don't want to have to have 16 terabyte of memory all congested and not being used and then have to manage it. I prefer to keep all that memory for user space, not for the cache. Any questions? So we were just talking about clean and inactive, dirty and right back, what the flush demon does. And the key ones here, dirty ratio, dirty background ratio, expire sent to seconds. And there is a lab for that. Now, I have to be careful because of your memory size. For example, Floyd 3 is twice the memory of Floyd 1 and 2. So I need to be able to write a file big enough to hit the ratio. And so you've got maybe 256 gig of memory and only 100 gig for disk space. 
So it's going to be hard for you to get enough dirty data to actually hit the thresholds. So you've got to drop the thresholds down to where you can actually hit them. But you will should still be able to see the expire flush. <clears throat> Again, there are case swap parameters to control the trimming, min slab ratio, how big the kernel can get. That looks broken to me right now. I need to prove that still. VFS cache pressure says when I trim, am I going to trim the slab or trim the cache? And swappiness says when I'm trimming, am I going to trim the processor or the cache? So let me go through that again. VFS cache pressure is waiting or describing priorities between the slab and the cache. And if I remember correctly, dropping it below 100 protects the slab. Going greater than 100 protects the cache. And then swappiness controls the balance between trimming the cache and the process is swapping. So a high swap is going to protect the cache and cause processes to swap. A low swappiness will protect the processes and be aggressive about trimming the cache. I do know people that are trying to advise to drop swappiness to a zero. Now, I, I kind of don't trust zero. I'm setting it to a one. But again, I was having problems last night in this area, so I basically undid all my SysCTL settings to get back to vanilla default. There's also an XFS SyncD, and I'm done. Let me do the CPU priority one real quick, and then we'll take a break. Is that okay? I have sure. been going almost an hour. Would you like a break now? No, you can go ahead. You okay, Thomas? Oh, yeah, you can keep going. I just want to get this done, but I normally try to do an hour. Now, first of all, in our market, we're basically turning off the CPU scheduler. We're doing D places and CPU sets to say, Pin me down, leave me alone, don't move me around. And a lot of sites are having problems in this area because they may be using CPU sets, but they're not pinning within the CPU set. So the load balancer is still moving threads around within the CPU set. We're using D-Place to turn all that off. Some sites are trying to use Numa CTL, but that does not give you thread to CPU affinity. On one of your systems, do a cat of slash proc slash dollar dollar slash status, and you'll see your affinity flags. So I had a CPU set dash Q script that I'm still trying to get working right for the parent PID and stuff that would list all the threads in the CPU set, give the CPUs they're running on, list the affinity mask for that individual thread, and then list the DLOOK where the memory got placed for that thread. This is extremely useful information if I can get it integrated and working. Again, everything is about locking it down, privatizing it, don't let anybody else come near me, don't let me bounce around, just give me a core and leave me alone. So I want to go through this, but basically preemptive time sliced operating systems, all of our systems now are preemptive. We used to work on uh, Windows 3.1 and DOS. Those were not a preemptive tight sliced operating system. Every program thinks it's the only one using the CPU, but we use time slices to limit the pro time of process connected to a CPU. Now, in old units, we used to call it major minor clock ticks, and we had a hertz. Old units used to say every 100... 100 times a second, wake up to wake up the CPU scheduler with a clock tick, and every second do a major scheduler cycle. Instead of calling this hertz or major minor clock ticks, Linux calls it a jiffy. So older Unix had a jiffy of 100. On Itanium, it went up to 1024 for a while, and now it's dropped down to 250 times a second. We get a clock tick, and... Uh, in PROC interrupts, that clock tick is called LOC. Now, I don't know if you're logged into uh, one of my systems, but uh, like on Floyd 1 in root bin, there is an instat script, or I mean command,
that will show you the interrupts happening. Instats is being integrated into Performance Suite. So basically every four milliseconds you're getting a clock tick to wake up the CPU scheduler. But the newer kernel now has gone to a tickless kernel, but that's giving us problems, so we have turned it back to a Jiffy-based kernel. So in this case, we're getting this clock tick on every CPU of the system 250 times a second. There is a kernel boot parameter called no hertz, which says, don't give me ticks. But we have problems with that, so we have turned it off right now, and no hertz equals off is in your kernel boot parameters. That turns it back to a tick-based kernel. In the tickless kernel, we don't have a clock interrupt occurring on every CPU every four milliseconds. Instead, there is one thread that is wandering around the CPUs to do the load balancing. And the problem was, was that that load balancer thread was having a lot of problems, load issues, large CPU systems, and also banging into other things like in the boot CPU set and stuff. So they've turned off the no hertz right now. Any questions on that? Are we okay? So at some point, they're trying to re reduce the overhead of these clock ticks. Now, again, in our scenario, we're just trying to lock things down with dplace, turn off the migration thread, and say, I know where I want to get placed. PBS is giving these CPUs, and I want to be pinned to my own private CPU there. So preemptive time slice results in a context switch. The state of a process is the register and the program counter. In fact, hyperthreads basically says there's two states on chip. They're still sharing the instruction pipe, but on Itanium, when I context switch, the thread that got swapped off the CPU would lose everything in the instruction pipe. With Nehalem and hyperthreads, the context switching does not throw away the instructions in the pipe, and they overlap and interleave in the instruction pipe, giving me better uh, utilization of the instruction pipe and better utilization of the core, what we call a micro no-op. So a context switch is disconnecting a process and then connecting another one. SAR-W tracks it. And it's not the subject of this class, but OpenMP is doing barrier synchronization with a SCED yield that can cause high context switching. And I'm going to mention it right now here. Now I'll wait. There is a SysCTL parameter SCED compact yield that really needs to be set to a 1. So time slices, we have a variable time slice now, anywhere from 4 milliseconds up to 800 milliseconds. 80 is the default. So you, your time slice is, is variable based upon your nice value. And unfortunately, they did something called a fair share scheduler concept called completely fair share. And it is not fair and it is not completely. Uh, this time slice is being looked at at hardware clock resolution. Now, we have a priority scheme in the kernel. There's something called static PRIO. And for the interactive user, that's any, and batch, that's anywhere from 100 to 139. Then there's an effective PRIO. And then the nice affects the priority. Now, in the real-time market, real-time priority, zero is the best and 100 is the worst. Uh, this is the life of a process. I think both of you have the background of, to uh, comprehend this quick enough. But basically, you start off with the parent. It then creates a child with a fork, maybe a clone. The kernel then creates the uh, process table entry, task table entry for it, and then puts it on the run queue. Over on the right, a process is either running in user mode, running in kernel mode, runnable, or sleeping. So once that, kernel, uh, once that kernel puts the process on the run queue, at some point the CPU scheduler says, let's connect it. So we do a context switch and put the process on the CPU. First thing the process has to do is take an exception. An exception is a software interrupt. And the first thing it's going to do is take a TLB miss to find itself, to find its executable. Now exceptions and software interrupts, uh, a TLB misses in particular, 
never lose the CPU. You have a hot path to get right back to the process. I don't want to take a TLB miss, lose the CPU, and get marooned on TLB misses. The second thing that I might then do is, for example, a read or a exec or something like that. That results in a system call. That goes into the kernel. Now, system calls are voluntary context yields. Every time you make a system call, you're giving the kernel a chance to context switch you. So these are called voluntary context switches, and they are being tracked in Linux. I think if you look at that status file, proc dollar dollar status, they've now added voluntary and involuntary context switches. It's also available in proc sked debug and stuff. Third thing that happens then, we get interrupts. A clock interrupt is going to come along. That is an involuntary context switch. So if I take a clock interrupt and lose the CPU because the kernel says somebody else gets it, that's an involuntary context switch. Also, I could have I.O. interrupts coming in. So if, if I get a clock interrupt, I might get preempted by the CPU scheduler and put back on the run queue. If I have an I.O. interrupt or I went to sleep, actually I went to sleep on an I.O., I did a read and had to go down to WCHAN. WCHAN is the kernel subroutine that I went to sleep on. Then the I.O. interrupt comes along and wakes me up and I get put back on the run queue after the wake up. So WCHAN is also referred to as a blocked process. It's a sleeping process. And this is where I was using WCHAN and also Crash or KDB to look to see how I got to WCHAN. And I find that information extremely useful. Last night when I had VI taking a few minutes to come in and out, I dropped into Crash and was able to see it was stuck on a slab trim. At some point, we get interrupts while we're in the kernel, and the kernel will handle interrupts while in kernel mode. There are interrupt counters, but I don't believe they're working right. I've seen a lot of interrupt handler time in the uh, uh, perf top. By the way, remember that UTC, UV UTC read we were seeing? That looks like it was coming from PCP. And I only confirmed that from a KDB, Arch KDB output where I could see it happening. So again, those kernel stack traces are extremely useful information for me. And also again, things like NCSA perf suite or the perf utility were able to profile kernel time, but not wait time. So perf top and PS run are profiling system time where I am in kernel code or in kernel spin locks, but they are not profiling the wait time. Only get delays tracks my wait times. So I'm dropping into crash or KDB to look at the wait times. At some point, the process either does an exit or a kill, and then we become a defunct zombie. We've been seeing those this week. Basically, when the child dies, the kernel sends a sick child to all processes on the system. When the parent forked the child, return to it was the PID. And if I didn't do an ampersand, the parent went to sleep on a wait. When you're using WCHAN, you don't care about wait. So when the, the parent in the wait state gets the sick child, it gets the PID and says, that is the PID of my child, and then picks up and inherits the child. Now, if I'm in a process storm, it may take a while for zombies or defunct processes to clear themselves up. In fact, we saw that earlier this week where we had a zombie stick around for a while. Also, I was mentioning where uh, network socket timeouts can have an issue. Saw somebody recently adjusting the network socket timeout to reduce uh, load contentions from these zombies that are around. Now, if the zombie has a parent that died before the child, that zombie may get stuck on the system and only a reboot will clean it up. And uh, basically, they get inherited by init with a parent PID of one. We okay with this slide? Yep. So I was just snapshotting different types of WCHAN events in here to show different things. Here's a barrier synchronization problem. Uh, 
for Thomas's sake, I consider barrier synchronization and OpenMP two types of barriers. Uh, Intel OpenMP does a yield barrier, and in, uh, SGI's MPT does a spin barrier. By the way, Jeff, the Intel MPI is also a yield barrier on our ice and stuff. Hmm. So a yield barrier. Basically, I'm sitting there, barrier synchronization is like phone tag. And I'm sitting with the other thread saying, are you done, are you done, are you done, are you done? And after a given amount of time, if I'm in a yield situation, I basically say, I'm, I'm tired of talking to you. I'm going to yield the CPU and let somebody else have it. There is a KMP underscore library environment variable that controls this with throughput, turnaround, and serial. And a throughput setting results in a yield type of barrier. And basically, we do the yield, it comes right back to the process that did the yield, and we can thrash and sked yields and get high system time. I don't have time to demonstrate that this week. But sked yields will cause heavy context switching and high system time. And there is a sysctl parameter if you grep for a compact compatibility. There's a uh, sked compact yield, I think is the name of it, that will work, make the sked yields work better. I don't have time to go into that anymore further right now. Uh, here again, I, I'm all back into WCHAN here, and I'm looking at this program. This thing I don't see anymore, but I would see the process. It should be 100% full, but this is just a wake-up type of thing. I didn't really get into any further on that. And here's one that's doing a sked yield. Uh, here again, I had a whole bunch of I.O. going on. Let's see, very little I.O. visible here. So, Jeff, I can see that this is an old top display because it's showing down now. And look at my load level here. I'm idle, but I have a high load level. These down locks, this is metadata intensive. These were being counted in the load level. But the newer kernel won't print out down. It will print out the lock that called it. I'm also seeing some XFS buff lock, buff uh, WCHAN weights as well. Uh, here then I went into crash and looked at it, and we were doing this yesterday, so here I'm doing my MEGDIR, here I'm trying to allocate the inode for it, and I have a, a, a transaction that has to go off for the uh, journal, and then here we are, XFS buff lock, waiting for a buffer cache buffer. And that is cache domination if I'm stuck on that lock, if I'm stuck on, I'm stuck on that routine. That's what cache domination will look like. I'm trying to get a buffer, I'm trying to lock a buffer, but I can't because there's so much contention in the buffer cache code. Let's see, I got a swap going on here, and here again, when I see wait IO, I'm typically looking for a sync page, congestion or block congestion, and get request. Again, these are kernel subroutines, and kernel subroutines do change their name. But those are the key three things that I see. There are other things that show up in Wait I.O. Uh, I have not gone into the kernel and figured out everybody that calls this. Now, this Wait I.O. was the uh, I.O. underscore schedule lock. I think it's actual I.O. underscore schedule underscore wait that these are calling. So the down lock is for metadata, shows up in the load average, but does not show up in weight I.O. Metadata weight does not show up, but data weight does, and those are the I.O. schedule type of lock. So here we did have one, a get request going to I.O. underscore schedule. So I'm trying to write, looks like some asynchronous I.O. going on here. Uh, a block write to begin. I got to grab a page cache. I got to allocate pages. Oops, looks like I got to free some pages out of memory here. So I had to shrink and go into the kernel and shrink the slab. Then I shrunk the inactive. Then I went to the page list. And then I had to, uh, looks like we're doing swap here. Looks like we then had to swap something out. Swap write page, submit the physical I.O. And my get request is a swap out of a page. This is why I like having access to the uh, stack trace. Any questions on this? This one's just doing a write. 
So here we're writing. We figure out a generic file. We do our block write begin. No memory trim going on here. No contention to get it. I get my XFS blocks. I map it to the device. I lock the inode, and then I start writing. So here's another one. I'm taking a page fault, but it looks like in this case my page is out on swap. So I've got to do a, do a page swap and then bring the page in. And here I went to sleep on IO underscore SCAD. Swapping will show up in the IO weight at top. Any comments on those? I'm probably going to pull out a lot of those traceback examples. But the, that WCHAN, the KDB, the crash output is extremely useful. Assuming this is, you can get to it. No questions? So, schedulers. The original scheduler we had in the prior releases was called an 01 scheduler. It had run queues, it had jiffies, it had fixed time slices based upon priority. They have now replaced in SLES 11 the 01 scheduler with what's called the completely fair scheduler. So it's new in 2623. First of all, it gives me the ability to have modular extension of classes. In other words, I can drop in different types of schedulers. Now, I thought this funny because they say you can add schedulers, but they didn't give us the choice of having the old 01 scheduler anymore. So the completely fair scheduler is going to give resource CPU utilization based upon an entitlement. This means if I'm running 100 threads and you're running four threads, I'm going to get marooned because you're entitled to as much t CPU capacity as I am if the entitlement is equal. So a completely fair scheduler can hurt multi-threading. Also, and this goes back, but I disagree with this because Instead, CPU sets are the way to go. Completely fair scheduler or the fair share scheduler that we were using 10, 20 years ago was appropriate on a small non-cache based system. But nowadays we've got lots of CPUs. This is kind of going the step backwards. But nowadays we've got lots of CPUs and instead we do things with CPU sets and dplates. Now the problem with the completely fair scheduler is Besides beating up in multi-threaded applications, they're getting more than their entitlement. If I lose my entitlement and get disconnected because I've been overrun what I've been entitled to, I end up context switching more. Somebody else comes in and pollutes the cache, and the CPU time that I'm getting that I'm entitled to is not productive because I'm going to have more cache misses. I'm not able to hold my data in the cache. So if you're entitled to 60% of the machine and I'm only entitled to 10% of the machine, I'm really not getting 10% because the cache misses due to the CPU scheduler are going to increase my CPU time. I'm going to put the number at 30 to 40%. So my throughput is going down and I am doing non-productive user CPU time thrashing on cache misses. That's why I don't like the completely fair scheduler. Now, another thing they did was they rebuilt the queue structures and created what they call a red-black tree instead of linked lists. So it's a search algorithm to go through the run queues. Also, uh, POSIX calls SCED underscore other, but we now call that SCED normal. That's the interactive user and batch. You're either real-time or you're normal. Now, part of this is something called wait run time. It's the amount of time the task should now run. That's my entitlement for it to be complete, completely fair and balanced. And there is a proc sked debug that gives the statistics in min v run time and execution run time. Also, the CTL has a scheduler granularity, 80 milliseconds by default. And they said scan yield improvements, but I have a multiple year uh, PV on scan yield not working correctly. And I can still prove that one. 
So the CPU has a run queue implemented as a red black tree. That's just a hash search algorithm. Each CPU has its own run queue. This is how I get affinity. The run queue is a pre-ordered red black tree of running and runnable processes. If I'm sleeping, I'm not on the run queue. And then each priority has a 5 red blue tr red black tree of its own. So we've got multiple hash trees in the run queue. Also, the run queue has an active and expired. Active are processes that have entitlement remaining. And active processes execute before expired. So always run an active before an expired. Now the expired are for processes that have exceeded their entitlement. And uh, just put a line through this right now. There's no more any priority skewing. Instead of priority skewing, you used to come in at 20 and go to 15 or 25. Instead of that, they have that uh, runtime thing that was on the prior slide. But I go to the expire chain, and that's the first to be load balanced or migrated to a less loaded CPU. Basically, we uh, load balance taking half the difference between them. We have greater than 25% difference between load, between load levels on the CPU. So we will examine all CPUs every time we process exact. We will pull from the CPU with the largest load level if we decide to balance. We will not pull cache hot processes. There is a field in the task table that says how hot we are to the cache. And we will not touch CPU set, dplace affinity, task set, or NUMA CTL that have affinity. And also, in the real-time market, we can turn off the load balancer with isolate CPUs. We also have in the real-time market SGI Shield that blocks the major minor clock tick CPU scheduler clock ticks. And that's called SGI Shield, part of React. So this is just showing context switching. I'm coming along. Every time I make, this is a time axis on the cross here. Every time I make a system call is an implied voluntary yield. That doesn't mean I actually context switch, but it tells the scheduler, hey, you just asked me to do something. Well, I, I may preempt you. Then we have a minimum time slice that's called HR. And then we get a clock interrupt, which is a jiffy. One every uh, 250, 250 times a second, every four milliseconds. Then we have a, a possible disconnect when we've exceeded our uh, entitlement. Again, the default slice that everybody should be getting without any priority or nice changes would be coming in at an 80 millisecond time slice. And then lastly, every 8 to 100 milliseconds, we do a load balance. Anything you want me to review? Nope. So NUMA effects are not visible if we get everything on chip. That's what I'm trying to say. You get a super linear speed up. If I can decompose my data, chunk it up, and get it on the CPU for the thread that's going to use it, and actually solve everything off a socket, off a core, or at least off of, off of the memory socket, I'm going to get the best performance. If I have to go off socket to the other socket, that's not too bad. But if I have to go off blade, I get a major impact. And again, some people are, I'm putting the number at 40%. Some people are going up as much as 60% degradation by going across the busy interconnect. Solve your application strides and false cache sharing problems first so you're not missing on cache. Cache strides has to do with rows versus, rows versus columns and a stride one pattern. Deal with thread hopping or migration. When you do a PS, there's a migration thread. When I go idle, I'll pull something into me. Don't oversubscribe your CPUs. You don't want things bouncing around, thread hopping. Even if I get a CPU set without D-place, my threads can be bouncing around due to the load balancer within that CPU set. Again, everything we're doing these days is to lock it down. So we can do task set, which people shouldn't be using, CPU sets, which everybody really is using, particularly batch, but I want to use dplace in combination with CPU sets so that each thread gets affinity. 
Then there's OM Place for open MP, for MPI open MP hybrids that basically builds a D place for you. And then there's Numa CTL. Now Numa CTL will say put it on these nodes, but it won't say put this threads memory on this node. And Jeff, we were playing with that code two in the system analysis class. I went from 10 seconds down to seven seconds by pinning everything on socket and on core. So I only went uh, eight threads wide to use the hyper threads, and then I gave affinity just to that socket, and I got it down to seven seconds from 10, just by not going anywhere and keeping it on socket. So right there, that was a 30% improvement, just by keep, keeping it on socket versus on blade. One of the things we're doing now are boot CPU sets to keep all the system demons away, all the OS jitter, as it's called. In fact, even on uh, our Tempo ICE systems, we turn off cron and we turn off everything on the compute nodes to keep away the OS jitter. And then there's this synchronous kernel, this Carlsbad kernel, that's meant, meant to make sure that the clock interrupts are synchronized across the cluster. So the CPU scheduler is waking up at the same time across the entire cluster. What we're trying to get to is something we used to call gang scheduling. In gang scheduling, we context switch all threads as a group. Uh, we're also using batch CPU sets. So uh, Moab, in your case, does support batch CPU sets. But I was not sure, this was at Oak Ridge, I wasn't sure that it was carving things out on socket blade IRU boundaries. I really do not want to interleave and said, give me one blade on each IRU, for example. I want to pack them tightly together. I don't want to have to have an interleave and be going across the interconnect. Uh, for MPI, there are environment variables to control how I pin things as well. So load balancing, if I greater than 25% imbalance between any two run queues, I pop up. We load balance on every fork exec. We do a load balancing every 100 to 8 to 100 milliseconds. The isolate CPUs will turn off the load balancer. We're going to pull from the highest load CPU. We migrate half the imbalance. So let's just say I got, uh, I'm just going to say 62 here. And maybe I've got 37 here. So I look at my load level of run queue, and I've got 62 processes here and 37 processes there. So I'm going to move half the I'm going to move half the delta. Okay, so 62 minus uh, 37 uh, was that 25. Uh, is that right? Looks right. Yep. So now I take 25 and add the 37. And I get what happened here. Oh, I take half the imbalance, so I don't take 25, sorry. So I'm going to take 12. Add 12 to 37. And that will give me uh, 49 here. And if I subtract 12 from 62, I get 50. That's the way it's basically working. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. So we just uh, move half the delta between the two queues. The, the migration thread that said I'm idle and looking for work and the other CPU that had the largest. Uh, we will pull from the expired queue first, then the active. We will avoid hot cache procs, something that is hot on the cache we're not going to disconnect, or I should say migrate or move, and we will avoid CPU sets or affinity types of things. Task set dash P again can show you your affinity. So this is the fun one. We have different priority schemes depending upon what tool you're looking at. The far left is what the kernel has. So in the kernel, we have something called uh, static PRIO. Now there is a lab, I don't care if you do it, but there's a lab where you drop into crash and, and get the priorities that are in crash. 
In the real-time area, it's called RT priority, and for batch and non-real-time, it's called static PRIO. A zero is your best priority, a 140 is the worst. The real-time, zero is the best, 100 is the worst in the real-time. And then 100 to 140 is for interactive and boot CPU sets and uh, batch and stuff like that. And everybody comes in by default at 120 based upon their nice value. So basically I'm anywhere from 100 to 140, but I typically am at 120. Now, when the priority is written into PROC PID stat, it subtracts 100 from it. If you see a negative number, that indicates real time. So subtracting 100 from it, when I come in at 120, I end up at 20. So if I'm in top, I see 20, not 120. If I did a nice 19, I'd go from 20 to like 1. If I did a nice 19, I'd drop from 20 to 39. And that would be visible at top. Now, don't ask me why. The code says for uh, SCO compliance and stuff like that, but I've never seen any priority schemes that are like this. But PS-C takes 39 and subtracts the priority from it, and that is called PRI. The more confusing thing, though, is PS-L that a lot of us use adds 60 to it, and that's called OPRI. So if I look at priority on top, I'm going to see 20. If I look at priority with PS-L, it's going to show 80. It's the same priority. They've Ooh. just been put on different scales. I don't know why PS-L doesn't give me the same as top by default. I think it should. So let me just show this. Uh, real time. Again, round robin, your time sliced by jiffies, and there's some real time system calls to do things. And one thing you can do is a first in, first out that says you do not lose the CPU by CPU scheduler. And it, the whole purpose of a sked yield is give up a CPU. There is a command called cheroot that can set to retrieve real time priorities. I'm just kind of listing the kernel threads here. Migration thread is the uh, the load balancer, basically. We have an event, events thread that allows an interrupt handler to execute in process mode. So events are driven by interrupt handlers. Usually for me, when I see events, it's due to metadata activity. We have interrupt handlers, IRQs and stuff. And again, the latest topology command will show you the node and the CPU that the interrupts are coming in for a particular peripheral and give you the IRQ number for that peripheral. So if I've got eight HBAs in there, they're all going to have different IRQ numbers and different nodes that they're attached to. Topology now has a dash IO and a dash AFF to give me affinity information. We talked about case swap D. That's managing my memory when I'm out of memory. That's trimming the slab and page cache. Uh, the rest of these I don't care about right now. We did look at K log, XFS log D. Uh, K journal D isn't listed here, but that one's been busy too. So here I was with my priority scheme. So I ran a program, and this is in the labs. First one is iteration, second was the priority scheme. And then I did a PS-O and looked at priority, pri, and O pri. Priority is what I'm going to see in top. And then pri was PS-C and O pri was PS-L. So when I did that, batch was at 15, 24, and 75. Three different schemes there. And then PRI actually came in at one, minus 100 or 139 or minus 40. And if you go back to that chart here, there is a, a table in the lab where you can basically prove this for yourself. Now, one thing I got to warn you, I put 99 here, but it's showing up as 100 here. I don't know where I'm off by one. When I look at the kernel code, the kernel code is subtracting 100 from PRI. But then when I look here, I ask for 99 and I'm getting minus 100. I did a priority of one and it came out as minus two. I did a priority of 50 and it came out as minus 51. 
I also did a priority of one, and it came out as 17. And here, same thing. Uh, this is old. I got to fix this. This is with a decaying priority. Basically, sleep would boost. This is uh, earlier kernels. Sleep would boost effective pri plus or minus five points. So you'd come in at 20, and then you'd get down to 15, which was better. from sleeps, and you'd go to 25 if you were hot on CPUs and hogging them. So you'd come in at 15 and would see the CPU priorities go up and down five points. So you would uh, go to 15, which is better priority, because you were sleeping. And if you were abusive on the CPU, you'd go from 20 to 25 and lose CPU priority because you've been dominating it. But that is an older kernel. If I needed to check here, oh, let's see. Oh, there it is. Two six two six twenty three kernel is when the uh, decaying priority went away. Now you still have a decaying priority concept. It's called wait runtime. It's just the top and PS are going to print to you this entitlement value that you have. So I was just going through an example, looking at different priority schemes. Here I did a went into crash, did a PS on uh, a particular uh, thread here. <coughs> then I did a task command on it. Uh, this is old too. Now it's just a uh, no, that's right. That is current. That is current. So we're printing out the task structure for that PID and grepping for the priority schemes. And again, everybody comes in at 20 or 120 by default. And that was called the effective priority, but as I mentioned, it no longer changes unless you nice. So here's the nice command. There are two different nice commands. There's one in the shell and there's one that's an executable. And some sites will use limits.conf to change nice. And in XNI and in D, I used to think, see things like FTP demons that would nice things down. And batch systems will have queues that might be niced. Cron events are nicing, like the uh, update DB for the locate utility is a nice. So same sort of thing. I ran with CPU spin and did nice with different things. And then looked at the priority scheme. So monitoring OS Viz, MP Viz, uh, on my 2048 CPU system after 10 minutes MP Viz did not come up. I was using PMG Sys instead. So CPU bottlenecks, if you have them, first of all find your inefficient applications, worry about barrier synchronization, false cache sharing. Cache busting is when my data set is bigger than the cache and I'm thrashing on, on cache. Take care of your crash strides, your TLB misses. All these things are in user time. And then we want to also worry about high system time. And we want to worry about thread hopping, and in particular, memory affinity. Uh, I was just talking about the load level. Sardash Q includes non interruptible. So Sardash Q, we started at the beginning of the week using a run queue size, running and runnable. P list size is the num number that exists in the process table. You played with a, a process storm to push on that. And then the load average includes the IOSCED, and I'm not listing it here. Oh, yes, I am. The down lock is listed as well. And this is a rolling or smoothed average rather than instantaneous over the last minute, five minutes, and 15 minutes. So here I have a Sardash Q report. Looks like something happened right here, but it takes a little while for it to actually show up in the one level and the 15 minute load level. 
I'm pretty much done here. There are some CTL SCED parameters, and there, the way you, instead of this SCED features, there is a sys kernel debug SCED features way of tweaking the, the scheduler features. This is the one that I was talking about before, SCED compat yield. That should be a one in my opinion. I have a PV on it. I explained that in the prior class. Now, all I'm trying to do in the last piece of this module is give you some documentation on the SCED parameters. I don't really have anybody documenting them. I did go in. I do. If you are interested in this in more detail, uh, particularly Jeff, I do have a, a, a postscript document that I put together on everything I could find out about the scheduler parameters. Presented it as an RFE to get some documentation for it. So there is something called scheduler statistics available now. So we get per process and per CPU information so we can see what's context switching. It's on. It gives us a proc sched stat, but in particular sched debug. And then each PID also has a sched file. Now, if you're going to play with scheduler statistics, I do recommend you send me email for the article that I have that pulled all the information together, including what uh, this uh, Rick guy has at IBM. He's an IBM person, and he has scripts to generate and process these trace logs. So basically, this is a script that came from Rick. I think Rick Lind was his name. And basically, what you're doing here is you have a collector that reads out a SCED debug periodically snapshots it into a file, and then the stats PL goes through it and figures out statistics. How many times did I go into the scheduler? How many times did I switch active or use existing? Tasks being wakened on the same CPU. Average runtime, latency. How many times I called the load balancer, things of that sort, to give you scheduler statistics. And then I'm just documenting, here's a prox get debug file, what's in it. So for each CPU, I can see about how many is running, how many context switches have occurred, number of uninterruptible processes, number of jiffies things have gotten, things of that sort. And there's also one, this is for the real-time queue. CF, uh, I think, C, C, I'm sorry, CFS is the uh, completely fair scheduler, and then RT is the real-time. Again, here I can see the yield statistics, uh, context switches, all that sort of stuff. I have documented these pieces, but I'm not going to go over them even when I don't remember all of them. But here's that min v runtime that I was talking about, my in, my entitlement. And then there is a proc get debug report there that then gave me the code, the PID, number of context switches, where it is in the tree. I don't really know much about that. The execution runtime, that's your entitlement concept. And then keeping track of your runtime versus your sleep time. And this is more for the kernel scheduler developers. But it is useful to be able to find context switch information. I also did a crash on a particular task, and you can see all the statistics that are coming out of crash for it. And then also in PROC PID SCED on a per thread basis. So here was bash, and we get all these statistics on a per thread basis. Number of switches, number that were voluntary context switches, involuntary context switches, times we had migrations and migrations that failed, things of that sort. And again, here is the, I don't want to call it priority, I want to call it the entitlement. There is something called C groups, which is basically a fair share concept to set your entitlements. So you can support groups, but there's no user capability. Only one can be enabled at a time. So you can set up a fair share tree and say, I'm going to give, I'm going to take 100% of the machine and say there's 124, 1,024 shares. Then I'm going to give Army 1,024, Navy 1,024, and out of Navy, I'm going to give aircraft 200 and ships 300. So it's a normalized entitlement concept. And this is just trying to show how to do that sort of thing. I'm not advising this, and I have no labs in this area. We use CPU sets instead. 
but here we're setting up a C group CPU set concept, making a directory, setting things up in it, and then running in it. I'm done. There are some uh, URLs here that are handy. Uh, anyway, any questions on the slides? Seems like a lot of detail that we may need at some point. <laughs> well, again, everyone's different, but uh, I'm I just pulling it all together into one place. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's good to have. Yeah. I think, uh, well, like I say, I always skip over the CFS stuff and the scheduler statistics stuff. I still miss par command and par dash q and stuff like that. That's kind of why I'm trying to show you what instrumentation is available. Yep. Anything else, Thomas? No, it looks good. I mean, it's mostly uh, above um, above where I usually work, so it's. Uh, Two. I, I'm more observing at this point. Yes, no, that's fine. But uh, like I said, I just wanted to skip over this quickly to explain priority concepts on the completely fair scheduler, let you know what's there. So okay. let's take a break. Let's come back on the hour. Let's come back five minutes after the hour, give you 15 minutes. Okay? Yep.
We back yet? I'm back. How about you, Tom? Give him another minute. My plan is to just walk through this chapter real quick and then go to demo and do I.O. in a CPU set situation. Okay. And right now, Jeff, since you're in field tech support, I'm including you on this uh, mem hardwall question that I've got going on. Sure. Oh, Thomas just sent me. There's something in chat. Stuck on urgent call. Please proceed without me. Hello? Hello. Is that you, Thomas? Yeah, it is. Okay. I, I haven't heard it ring before on this side. You okay oh. and ready? We were just going to get started? Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. So my plan is to flip through these slides quickly again and then get a, a demo uh, opportunity and basically do some I.O. in a CPU set situation. Okay. Particularly on multi CPU systems, as they get bigger and bigger, we really don't want things thrashing around. And everything again is about, I tell people, these large systems are really a bunch of tightly coupled systems that are loosely coupled together by NumaLink. And that everything about performance again is to lock it down, isolate it, make the caches private. There's even a discussion going on right now about hyper threads. And I get into political issues here as well. When I'm on a 2048 CPU system, uh, the kernel isn't really very good for that number of CPUs. You get a, high, a, lot of, a lot of high system time and stuff like that. And if you don't need large SMP, that you might be better off partitioning in it and using MPT. And, and even down to the boot time, things like that. So as the system gets bigger and bigger, there's a whole lot of issues. And, for a lot of us, we've jumped from the, uh, you know, under 128 CPU system now up to the 4096 CPU system, and that's a pretty big jump. So this module is all about affinity, part soft partitioning, and being able to break the system up into smaller pieces. Well, I'll briefly talk task set, CPU set, boot CPU sets. I know Jeff has quite a bit of background here right now. Don't be afraid to jump in, but how about you, Thomas? You got some uh, CPU set background? Uh, just a little. So if, if I skip over something, just ask, okay? Jump in. Okay. And I think the lab should be pretty good in this area. Uh, the uh, holiday week, the four-day week, the UVs are not being used, and if anybody wanted some machine time, I can arrange it. So in a multi-CPU situation, we have an API. Actually, this isn't really an API. We have our own SGI library called libcpuset. I only know uh, Torque PBS, I'm sorry, only LSF and PBS are using it. Torque does not use libcpuset. As far as I've been told, Torque is using the normal file system, make DIRs and stuff like that to create its CPU sets. But underneath there are different APIs. This is just a bad word here. But we've got task set, which is more for the real-time market. I don't advise using it. D-place is the most important thing that we're trying to deal with. And nothing can replace D-place. And then NUMA CTL can at least make sure that I stay on socket. But again, if I have uh, 128 threads, I'm not going to be able to say keep these eight threads on this uh, sockets memory and keep these eight threads on a different sockets memory. We really need to have D place with the IRIX functionality of specifying 
thread number, address range, and node or socket that they want it on. And again, a node and a socket are the same thing. So uh, yesterday I started to introduce this and I created a boot CPU set and I created a user CPU set. Now overnight I was having problems so I undid and redid some of this stuff. And to avoid complication here, Jeff, uh, PBS Pro was creating exclusive CPU sets. So I did, I'm looking at this uh, mem hard wall and spread stuff so I turned off PBS to keep it out of the picture right now. And another thing I did probably bad is I skipped a node so that my user CPU set is actually on two different blades. Uh, anyway, the whole issue of when you get past a certain number of CPUs, you've got to go to cluster. And uh, UV is ideal for the cluster situation using NumaLink instead of InfiniBand for the interconnect. Now it depends upon your application, but here, here's where I put things. I've got an MPI ping pong test and latency critical applications care about how long it takes to do things, not bandwidth. So when I'm on TCP, I'm going to put the number at 90, millis, 90 microseconds. With InfiniBand, I'm putting it somewhere around 10 microseconds. So you can have a case where the gig E card is getting faster and faster in bandwidth, but the latency is not improving. The latency is staying the, chain, staying the same. Most of that latency is driven by the kernel TCP stack handler. So one of the things InfiniBand does to get lower latency is a, a socket direct protocol. So when it opens up the socket to the system, it is doing DMA straight from the NIC or InfiniBand card straight into user space and bypassing the kernel TCP stack. Um, yeah, Numo link, and again, these are not marketing numbers, anything like that, but I'm putting that right around two microseconds on my systems. And then shared memory, like 0.3 microseconds. So in a cluster situation, the interconnect, it's not just the bandwidth you need to worry about, it's the latency. And I keep trying to tell people, don't think just bandwidth, also think latency. You've got two ends of the spectrum here. And if you tune for bandwidth and lose latency, that might hurt you. Just like overstriping with raids and putting everybody interleaving into one raid rather than uh, splitting them out into concats and not overstriping. Some people don't think of the uh, UV as a cluster, but I do, particularly if I'm going to go past two, two to four racks. And uh, again, the, the uh, interconnect now is NumaLink instead of InfiniBand. It's just that uh, UV is what we're calling a fat node, lots of CPUs on it, versus a thin node. And one of the key advantages is maintenance of the root and, and making sure that you know, it's easier to maintain a, a, a hundred roots than a thousand roots, that sort of thing. That's one thing nice about the Tempo product is it's really got one root per rack that's read only, so at least everything in the rack should be able to have a uh, homogeneous uh, kernel, a symmetrical kernel, unless they boot it on different kernels. So task set, again, maximize performance requires the CPU 100% of the time. And I want to be on the same CPU all the time. I don't want the load balancer bouncing me around. Now, when I'm on my laptop doing VI or web browsing, stuff like that, that is not cache intensive. And it's fine there. Hyper threads are fine there. But in the HPC market where I'm working on large matrices and doing matrix multiplies, FATs, and stuff like that, I need to lock it down, break up the array, put it local on my socket, and then let my cores on that socket do the work. Uh, this implies the scheduler should not schedule any other process there and only run on that CPU, con continually scheduling the same. Now, for IRIX people, there was an MP admin restrict capability. So basically, we have this isolate CPU that's meant for the real-time market. Isolate CPU basically turns off the load balancer and tells the CPU scheduler, don't do anything with it. 
but you still get clock interrupts there if no hertz equals off, and that's where we have uh, SGI shield to even block the, the major minor or jiffy clock ticks going on. But I'm not sure when we go to a tickless kernel uh, how SGI shield plays into that. So you want to force the processor always to be scheduled on the same CPU. And these, in task set, one of the problems is the CPUs are physical. And if I'm a part of a CPU set, then I've got to know the physical CPUs. Uh, in, uh, I've got job examples, but in my PBS Torque uh, LSF job examples, I have a couple of lines where I'm catting out the CPU set attributes that I'm in. So the job will say, this is the name of the CPU set you're in, here's the CPUs you got, here's the MEMS you got, here's the spread settings, things of that sort. Again, CPU sets can keep th other things away from your CPU, but everything has to be fenced into a CPU set. Uh, children inherit running on the same CPU, and then the load balancer should come in and undo that. So here's the task set command. It replaces the old IRIX run on. It is standard Linux. Uh, in the workbook, the notes underneath basically are a hex to binary mapping. So this is a hex bit mask. And by the way, there is a lib bit mask library that allows you to manipulate CPU number to bit masks. It started from SGI, but it is integrated into SLES. But we still have a newer upstream version. So you, you usually want the SGI lib bit mask, not the uh, SLES version of lib bit mask. So in this example, uh, CPU 1, or a first bit set would be CPU 0, then one, two, the, the other three bits are open, then we got two bits set here, which would be CPUs 4 and 5, and then we got one bit set here for CPU 8. So that's just a hex to binary mapping, and the notes underneath kind of give you the mapping. Now I thought this strange, task set dash P, normally after a P you have the PID, but the way this command works is it's the mask and then the PID. So the A8 is going to put me on CPUs 3, 5, and 8, 3, 5, and 7. I can also do it by CPU number. And then lastly, I can get the affinity mask with the task set dash P. I won't go to uh, my desktop for a minute here. So I'm just going to do a task set dash P on dollar dollar, and it's giving me the bit mask. Interesting bit mask, huh? F0, 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 F0. So I'm going to cat slash proc slash, I'm sorry, proc slash dollar dollar slash CPU set, and I'm in the user CPU set. Now I reconfigured this from yesterday on purpose. And if I do a uh, cat on slash devs, slash CPU set, slash user, slash CPUs, I have deliberately created an interleave. I'm not necessarily advising this. Now looking at these numbers, what command do you think I want to run to figure out how they map out? Apology. Or sorry, CPU. No. Good try, though. CPU map. Yeah. CPU map will give me the, the sharing. Topology won't. Okay? So topology will not tell you the cores that are on a socket or the physical and the virtual. You okay with that, Jeff? Yep. So what I have here... I was in 4 to 7, 12 to 15. Okay, so 4 to 7 is socket 5, or node 1 in my case, and 12 to 15 is the other socket. I have deliberately skipped this blade, particularly because the last side I was at, they were interleaving like this, not in the same IRU, but, but they were not contiguous CPU sets in the real world, in the socket area. Then the other CPUs, 20 to 23 and 28 to 31, are the hyperthreads. 
concepts. And I said 20 to 23 and 28 to 31. So I basically took this socket and this socket. Okay? And let's see. They're on two different blades, by the way, too. So this is not what I would normally advise. I would try to do contiguous and say, let's make this the CPU set, boot CPU set, or in worst case, just one socket being the boot CPU set, one socket being the user CPU set, and then two sockets for PBS. That's the way I would have normally done it. That's the way I had it going before. But because I had issues uh, on MEM hardwall and stuff that I'll explain, and because the site was interleaving and skipping socket, skipping nodes and sockets, I wanted to try something different. Any questions? So if I cat my uh, itsy cpu set underscore user dot com, now that's my own naming convention. This is a hard part for me, Jeff. I'll get to a site and they don't know where their CPU set was actually configured. <laughs> so I'm going to itsy in and dot d and try to look for any sort of CPU set syntax. But I kind of like to have a convention where in itsy they're all CPU set underscore and then the name of the CPU set. Yeah. So here again, these numbers here. I do have a PV to get these to work uh, in a partition basis. This is the physical socket number, not the partition socket number. So this is zero. So I took one and three as my sockets. Okay, any questions? Now if I go back to that task set, the thing is, I don't find this too friendly. I can't figure that out. And this is the hard part when I was on a 2048 CPU system. I printed out CPU map and had a hard copy next to me so that when I saw groupings, because it's hard to figure out how these actually map to a socket or a core. So I was actually going to a hard copy and circled out where the boot CPU sets were, which were actually in the upper virtual CPUs, and the user CPU set was up in the upper virtual CPUs. And then PV, uh, Torque Moab was using all the lower CPUs. And then they were not scheduling on the hyper-threaded CPUs except for the boot and the user CPU set. But then I couldn't tell whether PBS Pro was giving the other core on those virtual CPUs to somebody else. I couldn't see if there was contention between them. So again, it was kind of nice on the uh, ICE products where it rotated physical, virtual, physical, virtual. Here now it's physical, physical, physicals, and then the virtuals. <laughs> that's so it's hard to I, see the groupings. It, and again, not, on it, Itanium it, systems, a lot of people would do an interleave pattern and would skip sockets. Now why were they doing that on Itanium? Why would we skip a socket and do interleave? You have better access to memory. Less contention on the front side bus to memory, yes. So and, people and are still trying to I... use that kind of interleave skip pattern, and and the the mapping of the processes are different. Okay. Now I can still see, uh, for example, uh, recently they were talking about turning off hyper threads on one of our systems, and pointing out that having the hyper threads there it creates more uh, more threads that could saturate the QPI that's getting off to the system. So again, in a memory contention situation, memory intensive applications, they're trying to back off on that and not have as much there, not much, not as many processes uh, contending for that particular socket, for example. But going back here, again, I'm just trying to say it's hard for me to map these out in reality to figure out Am I getting into a contiguous socket situation? Do I have affinity and do I have all my neighbors? And is anybody else stepping on my virtual CPU? Am I in a topology friendly situation? Are you okay with that? Yep. So the other thing then, I don't necessarily always like a bit mask, but then I do have the ability to see it by CPU numbers as well. Okay, so I can see I got MEMS 1 and 3, and I got these CPUs here. And my current environment, I am in the user CPU set. 
So task set is nice in that sense, but again, it's easier for me to map and see this here. But what I really want to see here now, and this is not working yet, so I'm going to do this, this is my own script, and I'm again saying here is the CPU I found, here's how it's configured, but again, this, I would like this to actually tell me what's the total number of CPUs in the CPU set, and how are they placed, what, are they topology friendly or not. And then I'm giving the attributes of the CPU set. And, and these two things are things that you need to watch out for. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, Thomas, that Moab Torque was having problems with CPU zero. I believe it, it, and when I asked the admin, he couldn't tell me specifics. But uh, I last night realized that it was setting CPU exclusive and memory exclusive and CPU zero. You CPU zero to be exclusive. Here's the thing that I think is broken right now, and then here's what I want to prove is working right now. But again, I don't think that you necessarily want to spread. This is going to spread things across, but you're going to lose affinity when you do that. And this customer wanted to have the user CPU set have affinity to the network buffers that NFS were feeding in, and the network buffers are in the slab, and they were spreading it around rather than having affinity to the particular process that wanted them. So this is still, you know, a debatable your mileage may vary situation, but I can see at least setting hard wall to a one, but it seems to be behaving like it's got a one right now. And then setting these to a zero, assuming I can hold my assets on, on the, in the CPU set on the socket and I'm not going to thrash my assets. So again, before we had set them to a one because I'd read in my file, suck up all the memory on that node, and then allocate memory for my application and everything that I read into cache on that node would get trimmed. But we have much larger memories now. And again, the memories are tightly coupled to the sockets, so affinity is much more critical. So then I'm running a PS on basically going into the task file, running a PS on dash L on every thread that's in that CPU set. And I'm running it IRIX mode, so I get the CPU number and I get the RSS size. And I wanted WCHAN too. And then here's my boot CPU set. Okay. But what I was trying to do now was add a dash V option. And this is what's not working. So that it would give me the process, the PS. But it would also, let me fix this here because it's not working. Uh, I commented out here. And again, it's not working here. What are you trying to get, Dave? You're trying to get the, the DLOOK output? No, I'm getting the DLOOK output. What I'm not getting is the status, the, the affinity flags. And it was I was in the wrong section. The first section is global and the second section is by CPU set. There we are. My problem, Jeff, is when I'm actually getting I want to make sure that I run DLOOK and and grep the proper thread ID when I'm going into threading. This is where I'm getting into the problem. Making sure that I get the proper parent PID and the proper thread ID. That's where I'm getting into trouble. Oh, because you're not you're not Finding the parent? Correct. It's not, you'll see what I mean. Okay, okay, yeah. And I do want to file an RFE on this because this is what everyone's doing the hard way. And on a big system with uh, 4096 CPUs, it's hard to pull this stuff apart. Right. So, so here, here's what's happening. So some of these, it's finding a parent PID that's one, and then there is nothing there. So trying to get the hierarchy, but here's what I was trying to get was this concept right here. Right. Okay. So that for one process I get the PS entry, and then I wanted these things, 
And then I want to make sure also that I get the memory placement where all the pages for that thread are so that I can actually look at 64 threads and watch the CPU list skew and the node skew and the, the nodes that they're on skew. So I can actually right. see the stride pattern within the topology. So I'm not, I don't want to get into this whole problem right here right now. I'm just trying to show proof of concept. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do have a, uh, I'm not going to do it right now, but I have a PBS job that does pinning, and then I'd be able to actually see a pin and watch, you know, it's going to go CPUs, physical CPUs, you know, like 14, 15, 16, and each thread would have affinity and, and actual placement that was clearly topology aware. That's what I'm trying to get to. Does that make sense, Thomas? Yep. So for every thread, I want to know how big it is, you know, how much time it's consumed, if it's running or sleeping, what CPU it's on, that sort of information. But then, rather than using the task set command, I thought it was easier to actually see this. And then I'm getting both CPU and memory affinity bits or affinity uh, attributes and then actually see where it got placed. And so this one shows you have 105 pages on node zero, yet that's not one of your mems. Correct. Or not. And I'm not positive D looks running on the right PID right now either. Okay. I, I would also say that, that it's simply shared text from the machine booting. Correct. Right? That's also true. So there are still going to be things on node zero from the boot CPU set. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. I'm just warning myself that I'm not positive I'm getting the D-look summary information on the proper thread ID either. Okay, got it. So assuming the data here is running correctly on the correct thread, that's what I'm trying to get into a single report that would be user-friendly. And then I would get one line. Notice some of these didn't give me anything. But I don't want to get into my implementation issue. I'm just trying to get proof of concept of what I'm trying to get to. And then I'd be able to see this one's on CPU 4, the next one's on CPU 5, the next one's on CPU 6. And I'd be able to see the node that they have affinity to. So there is no NUMA CTL or D place in this example. But I've got a PBS one where I could do that sort of thing. Sure. Okay. So my problem is making sure that I get the proper path to the thread. That's that's where I'm having trouble. Okay? So I don't disagree, but I'm just warning that I'm not even positive. I could do a set echo or something like that and make sure the D-look is on the proper thread ID. Uh, yep. not, no problem. So th that's the concept. Let me go back to the workbook. So I got off on that because you can get the affinity mask, but I'm not sure that the mask is as useful as getting both the CPU and the memory by CPU number. And of course, when you're looking at the PS command, it's CPU number there. So I'd be able to see PS show the CPU number it's running on. I'd be able to see the affinity mask saying it's the affinity mask specifying it's only the CPU and the uh, memory affinity mask saying it's on this node. And then I'd like it to say that this node is uh, on the socket that that core is on so that I truly do have affinity everywhere. But everyone agrees affinity is critical here. I'm just trying to find an easy way on a like a 64 thread wide application to say are each of these 64 threads on a unique CPU? So when I was at Oak Ridge a lot of them were just wide open and there were, I found cases where there were four threads on the same CPU and stuff. And then you got load balancer coming in and all that sort of stuff. So it wasn't easy to see when they were complaining and running and it was coming up with different timings with each run, uh, complaining about what's going on. And I had to basically figure out, well, how do I look at these 64 threads on a per CPU basis? And, and I need to be able to run the PS and the test, the uh, status file and the DLOOP quick enough before the thing goes away and stuff. We okay? 
So we have CPU set, sets. We've got non-exclusive and exclusive. Non-exclusive threads attached to the CPU set only run there, but threads not attached can also run there. So what a lot of people do is use the boot CPU set and the user CPU set so that everything is in the CPU set. At that point, you really don't need non-exclusive. You don't really need exclusive. But uh, Torque, Moab, PBS Pro, we're setting exclusive. So exclusive, threads attached can only run there, and threads not attached cannot come into your CPU set. So some people get this backwards, but the exclusive says nobody can come into me, whereas they think the exclusive is saying I can't go out. So it's the CPU and set itself and the definition of the CPU set that contains my user space within the CPU set and my CPUs right. within the CPU set. So this is why we have a boot CPU set to fence in, in it and XI in D. In my case, if you look at my uh, nothing underscore local script, I figured out the PID of SSHD and then put that thing into the user CPU set. And then anybody logs in with SSHD goes into the user CPU set. If I log into the serial console, that's, that's a TTY, not an SSH, and that one comes into the boot CPU set. And there are times as root, I still want to go into the global CPU set, which is basically the entire machine. So why do we use a CPU set? Restrict consumption of resources and dedicate them to particular processes and threads. And uh, workload managers have advanced scheduling extensions for CPU sets nowadays. Again, we're trying to limit, limit runtime variability and reduce interference between jobs. And I can show you data where I can get a easily create a 60% degradation in my CPU time from interference and from the CPU scheduler bouncing me around. Also, again, I was trying to do a memory affinity. So, Jeff, when you were in the system analysis class, I was not using Enuma CP, CTL to give me memory affinity. Once I actually did get a memory affinity down to the socket, I shaved three seconds off of it. I shaved another 30 seconds. Off my uh, from 100 seconds to 20 seconds to 10 seconds to se 7 seconds. And now I'm trying to get shorter than 7 seconds. Now this is what I do not know about right now. This is the, the thing that I'm questioning, whether it's behaving correctly, but mem hardwall a 0 versus a 1. So isolating the I.O., that's what I want to go with in demo here. So in the older releases, it isolated, and right now it's behaving this way. But a year ago, it was not when they introduced the MEM hardwall. We have static CPU sets. That's what my user CPU set is. And once I start up PBS Pro, I'll have a dynamic CPU set. So uh, 2.6 kernels is when we get a redesign of CPU sets. They really started from Sun Solaris as P sets. Then we implemented CPU sets in IRIX for our first Origin 2000 NUMA machine. Then it got uh, implemented in SGI's SAIL, ProPack 3 based uh, Linux. And then it got pushed into the Linux, or I should say the Linux community accepted it. So it started as a Linux community solution in 2.6.12. Now the CPU set package and the lib CPU set are still SGI proprietary, but you do not need them to do CPU sets. The CPU set library is used by LSF and PBS Pro, though. It is not used by Torque or the Torque Moab. And some people like the CPU set command for convenience. So the CPU set command is in a package as well. Now, CPU sets are in a file system hierarchy concept, so they can overlap and stuff. It's mounted in FS tab. Now, when you load the SGI CPU set package, it adds an FS tab entry for you. Again, CPU sets can be subsets of CPU sets. So I'm going to create a PBS Pro CPU set and then have jobs within the that that are sub-CPU sets of everything. And permissions on the dev path determine access. And the CPU set command line is different. One thing that was missing from the older days was a CPU set dash Q. And that's kind of why I have my own CPU set command and name it dash Q to give me process information, thread information for what's in my CPU set or a specified CPU set. Uh, I had RFE'd that a long time ago, but it dropped off the list. I'm ready to RFE it again. 
So we can control CPSS by three different ways. Make derb, which is what the lab is doing. Lib CPSS, which is what LSF and PBS do. And the CPSET command, which is what I was doing in my demo earlier today when I created my ITSE CPSET.com and also the nothing underscore local script that created the user CPSET. So uh, Thomas, the Oak Ridge was using the CPSET command during boot to create their user CPU set, and then PBS Pro, I'm sorry, Torque in that case, was using MakeDir to create the individual job CPU sets. And all set CPU sets begin with slash. When it's just slash, that's the entire system referred to as the global CPU set. So I'm just trying to show an organization here under dev CPU set with a boot. I'm going to have a user and I'm going to have a PBS Pro. So, simplistically, this is what I was doing. I created an set underscore user dot com, put in my CPUs, put in my maps. We just looked at those. I was not using exclusive because everything is boxed into a CPU set. Then I, in my uh, nothing underscore local, I created a CPU set with this, this syntax. Now, remember yesterday I had order problems, so I had to move PBS later in the order so that the user CPU set would happen before PBS took everything. So Torque has to run after the creation of that nothing script, or nothing was failing, saying all the CPUs are gone. I can't take them. Now, when I was in the dev CPU set, I did an LS, and then I did an LS here, and I see now a directory called test. I chmodded it just for permissions, CD'd into it, and when I did an LS, when you do the make dir, or the CPU set dash C, it automatically populates that directory with the attributes of the parent. Now this didn't seem to be working right for me last night. I was getting some CPU sets created where the spreads were coming out at zero, not one. I don't know what's going on there. So normally I'm seeing normal uh, inheritance of the child. Again, some sites will have a set UID program because you need permissions to write these. But to have a set UID program that would print out the attributes of your CPU set and allow you to modify the attributes of your CPU set. At least the exclusives and the spreads. <coughs> so CP exclusive says, if I mark this CPU set as exclusive, nobody can take CPUs from me. Nobody can come into my CPUs. Memory spread slab, again, can I round robin my slab? And this is what was of interest to me with the TCP network buffers. Do I want them local on the node where the NIC is associated with or do I want to spread them around the CPU set? I think they might get better performance if they can hold it local and have affinity to it. So the program that reads it, reads it into its own socket and doesn't have to go to other sockets to get the data. As long as that asset can stay on socket and not get squeezed out by something. So the only reason I want spreads is when I when I'm going to bust the the capacity of the resource that I'm abusing. Like I said, does my classroom fit into the Ferrari? If not, I got to go to something else. So when people talk about your mileage may vary, my whole thing is can I hold it local and keep it local without anybody else polluting it? or losing the affinity to it. If I can keep it local and keep it affinity local, that's going to be your best. Now the hard part also is if I'm doing disk I.O. and my uh, interfaces are all spread across IRUs for an interleaf pattern. I almost wanted to recommend a, a, a Oak Ridge to put all the NICs in the same node so that all their NFS traffic is coming straight into the user CPU set where they're doing NFS, or at least, uh, in that case, into the user CPU set. But I'm trying to avoid using the interconnect or abusing the interconnect and trying to reduce contention on the interconnect and reduce latency. So in the slab, if you do more on uh, proc slab info, you will see sockets and uh, NFS caches and stuff like that in the slab. The tax file is the PIDs or thread IDs that are in the CPU set. 
Uh, I was doing an echo dollar dollar into dev CPU set uh, tasks to get me into the global to break out of the CPU set, assuming I'm root. The CPUs that are in the set, there's something called memory pressure. Now this says if I'm swapping or not. There is a program out there, Policy Kill D, that uses memory pressure to detect the CPU set that's in an OOM situation and then kills them. And this is the other thing, Jeff, I was complaining about at Oak Ridge. I was advising them to put swap back on. Then they're not going to hit OOM as quickly. And then the OOM storm on Varlog messages isn't going to stall their system out for 30 minutes three times a day. The other thing they needed to do was better uh, batch limits. They didn't have a per user batch limit. They allowed like 37 jobs globally but one user could stuff the queue and basically fill it up with MATLAB is what was creating the OOM. And I don't think the job was actually declaring the amount of memory it needed to get a CPU set sized enough to avoid hitting OOM within the CPU set. Anyway, we had MEM exclusive just like CPU exclusive. Earlier in the week I had problems because PBS had taken stuff and I couldn't run my user CPU set script because PBS marked it as exclusive. And then we have memory spread page. So this is my page cache. Anything dirty, read, write, all that sort of stuff. Now I'm not talking tempfs. That's that MPOL equals on the FS tab when I mount tempfs. Anyway, so I created the CPU set here, listed as attributes. And then I ran in the CPU set by doing this. Now that CPU set command does not take arguments out here. You can only run a script. If I have a dash out here, even if I quoted and stuff, the CPU set command cannot pull apart arguments that are on the command. And I don't use that very often. Then I did cat the CPU set test test file to see the PIDs. So that CPU set Q script I have basically grabs these TIDs, then does a PS-P on them, and then is trying to use that PID and find the parent and find the path to proc PID task TID status. And that's where it's choking because of the thread issue. It works fine on a PID, but not when there are threads there. And you will have thread IDs in here. Moving on, this is the way Torque and Moab are doing it. They're going to do a make dir, set permissions. They cd into it, set permissions again, and then we echo the CPUs there, echo the sockets, and then echo the PID that we want in that CPU set. Now you have to be a little careful. It's not an issue anymore, but there were two echoes, one that's built in the shell and one that's an executable. And the built-in shell one was losing the uh, P error diagnostics. And in the older days, if I just did echo and specified a CPU that wasn't really there, there would be a no space less on device message, but it's not that anymore. But uh, with the echo, you wouldn't see the error. With bin echo, you did. So again, I basically did an SH to show that the child inherits the parent, and then I did a cat of my CPU set and a cat of my status file. And here I was looking for the affinity. Any questions? So the other thing we already did yesterday was I went into my itsyelilo.com file and created in the append statement an init equals. Uh, in some cases, I might create a separate stanza, clone the stanza, and have one that is without a boot CPU set and one that's with a boot CPU set. And then I created a uh, boot CPU set.com file. And again, I chose socket zero for my boot CPU set. And I showed you the verbose yesterday as well. And here's what I was bugging you, Jeff, about. I want to use CPU map, not topology, to see how I'm mapping onto cores and sockets. Topology doesn't give me that detail. Also, there is a var run CPU node map file to map things to figure out what node a CPU is on. 
Uh, just in case, Jeff, I have a PD that's observed because when I was at Raytheon, this was a garbage file. It was not. It was not right. It had stuff in it, but the mapping was not correct, and I never pursued it further. So in my case, I was using CPU map to get my mapping, but in the older days, I'd use the CPU node map to figure out these are the CPUs, what nodes are they on. But CPU map is better now. So here's the thing that's a, a hot issue for me right now. Configure your kernel page cache, round robin. Do you need latency or bandwidth? Does your file and application fit on node? Configure it on boot with that CPU memory spread. I can see turning it off to keep them to a zero now. Assuming that I can hold my access and they're not going to get thrown away and stuff. This gives me better affinity. Also, there is the ability to do this memory pressure enabled. It's set globally, and then a memory pressure within each CPU set contains zero until swapping occurs. Okay, and I don't think you see anything in there until you actually have swapping going on. So, and I don't know about a load impact of turning this on. I tried to check before I went to my last site, but they had turned on the memory pressure enabled, but they had no swap, therefore there was no data there. Uh, so when a CPU set is out of memory, we want to do a node aware reclaim, and then BC free in a CPU set will result in memhog, but we can hit an oom. I need to add that onto here a CPU set OOM occurring. And I was pushing on that last night as well. Now when I hit an OOM within a CPU set historically, my interactive and my boot CPU sets were still intact. The, the kernel was still in good shape and I got decent response. But then at this last site I started getting OOMs within a CPU set and it didn't really correlate to subjectively what I was feeling until I saw syslog and the root device and the uh, basically a buffer cache domination storm. That's the way I describe it. it. And I was sitting there when this was happening, I had no root access, but I said, this feels like buffer cache domination. And then I was able to see the, the IO going to the swap device, I'm sorry, to the root device, but I couldn't get the var log message to, to see it, but I did see syslog pop up. And then I realized that the verbosity, the zone info on a oom was basically pounding on my root and pounding on my cache. And it wasn't the system time, it wasn't the oom, it was cache domination. Now there is a PV from last fall to basically quiet down and reduce the amount of information on an OOM. And the OOM zone info is per CPU as well. So you get a report on a per CPU basis. And that just gets really verbose. There is the ability of memory migration, moves memory from one set to another. And again, DLOOK can show you where your pages are. And I have that uh, 20 line DLOOK dash summary to summarize the DLOOK report. How to do it in LSF. In PBS, I basically, you link or copy, there's a special binary there for you. And then there were some uh, configurations in the SCED config file. And those are not on by default, Dave? You have to actually do those? I uh, don't know anymore. These were my notes from the PBS documentation at the time. Okay. But uh, like I say, we're on a newer PBS. What's the newest one now, 11? Uh, it's 11, Brian Lacau was just testing. The yeah, and that's 11. the one with, with the database and all that kind of stuff. I've had trouble getting that running over and over again once they added that database engine to it. And you know what, it, it, it's one of those things where their upgrade path testing sucked. Well, I even starting from scratch, I still had problems, but anyway. Moving on, I haven't gone to the newer one because I've had too many problems. 
and uh, use you know ease of installation and stuff. But moving on, uh, for Thomas's sake, PBS Pro now has a database engine. Was it a MySQL or something? And uh, you have to add an additional user account that it's running as. And uh, there is a new tool called PBS Analytics that can actually go in and plot your data and stuff. So they they put a database engine into the latest PBS now. Anyway, that's all I can really add, Jeff. So I was not setting those other ones, Jeff. I was just copying the CPU set mom in place and not making any other changes. Uh, D place. So this is the big one now. Default memory allocation is node local where I touch it. D place allows a particular thread to get to put bound to a particular CPU, and we are now stopping migration. So sites are running in a CPU set but not using D place, and then they're flipping around and the load balancer is moving, thrashing them around in the CPU set. And even at the last site, I was seeing cases where I had three or four worker threads on the same CPU. Now, D-Place requires knowledge of the application. This was painful in that class because they had a 64-thread application and I didn't know the spawning order. So I needed to make sure they weren't spawning anything else, like doing a system library call. So I had to run S-Trace and track all the clones and forks on it to see what it was cloning and forking. And the main thing is your second thread in OpenMP is a shepherd sleeper that you want to skip. So D place dash C for your CPU list. S to skip, that's used in MPI to skip the MPI run command. You can do exact placement. You can place by name only. This is the common one, a skip mask. And this is something that NUMA CTL cannot do. Now, I can put this in a placement file. And this is one, uh, Jeff, I also advise Oak Ridge to look at. Replicate your shared text to each node. This was meant for large CPU systems. So I don't have to go across the interconnect to get to that shared text. Like you were just noticing that Moore had a whole bunch of pages on node zero, assuming the DLOOK was on the right PID. Yeah. Now this will waste a little bit of memory, but shared texts are generally not that big. So this undoes shared text. That way I don't have, say, a, a 512 thread application going across the interconnect to get some DSO. I make a copy of it local. Now, that I don't know about this yet, and Jeff, you can check on it too. When you do a man on D place, I know you don't see my screen right now, but the R has three things, replicate the library text, replicate the binary text, but there's a third option I do not understand. I've got to talk to uh, Jack Steiner on called thread round robin option. I don't know what that one's doing. So I got, I got kind of burned for not knowing that one. So the dash R option specifies replication will improve performance by reducing the need to make offload node memory references for executables. Okay, so I think that that one on these larger systems are going to become even more critical. And then there's a queue option and actually a couple of queues to be able to list the, the load balancing information. So examples, I did a D-place putting date on CPU4. Uh, MPI run, I did a D-place. Now this is wrong, Jeff, because if I'm in a CPU set, I'm going to pretty much start off at zero. And this one is old too. Dash X6, nowadays we're using dash X2. And then here was the interleave pattern I was talking about earlier to, to rotate between front side buses. And nowadays we, we wouldn't be doing that, particularly if I'm in a CPU set. And this one's just showing a DLOOK running on something. And I have a DLOOK dash summary available now. Now uh, here's a placement file where I can say anything that's forked off named GMPI that's running on CPU zero should get placed on CPUs one to three. And some fancier ones down here. So at, when I was at this last site and they had this benchmark running with, uh, I think it was 128 threads that were going on, 
I had to use S trays to see what the spawning order was like to make sure they weren't spawning stuff that was then spawning stuff. I needed to know the spawning order. Next was Numa CTL, and they were trying to use interleave. And Jeff, you were, we were talking about you trying this with your memhog. So you can see memhog go one node, then the next node, then the next node. Now in your case, that was the calic that was actually taking all the memory on the system. But right. if I were to make it smaller, you know, maybe divide it, make it a tenth of memory, and run it as first touch, and then run it as interleave, you're going to see that interleave is significantly slower. In the older days, it was not. So again, the interleave was meant to take advantage of the bandwidth because the memories were attached to the hub, not to the socket. But I still try to warn you, just because I've allocated quickly doesn't mean I'm going to have affinity when I'm actually processing the data. So you may be able to get the and What you were doing, the calic, was just an initialization. There was no post-processing there. Right. So when people are looking at node info with the uh, hit and miss, and trying to get the allocation quicker and everything, I got to warn them, just make sure that you're processing the data the way you allocated. And this is what University of Minnesota was bit on. In fact, why DLOOK summary was, was kind of rough together was to be able to look at where the pages were for the individual thread to find that affinity. And then they realized that the array was not being initialized the way it was being processed. That's the big point I keep trying to remind you of. So node info tells me about the allocation, but I don't have anything to tell me about memory references after it's allocated. And I'm desperate to have something like dprof. And, and dprof could actually profile my references and generate a dplace file, and this was irix, so that I could actually uh, place a thread and its memory and specify the node I want the memory on. So you actually had a syntax that would give you the thread number, the address range, and the memory node you wanted it on. Then you're guaranteed that you've got the affinity when you're processing. So think about that origin optimization guide I showed you earlier where I showed you everything spread across everything versus a, uh, a, a rotation that was going on where each thread had its own private memory that was on its node. Any questions, Thomas? Nope. NPVIS used to be nice, but at my last site, it, after 15 minutes, I gave up on running it. But it was a way of looking at a large CPU system to see what the CPUs are doing. You could place your cursor over one of these things and figure out what CPU it was. I have not uh, filed a bug on the time it takes for NPVIS to run. I got higher priorities. PM Hub is top priority for me with the PCP group. Then I was looking at top to see the CPU that I was running on. Again, that's only the last CPU it was running on. That's why I wanted the affinity mask information, the, the MEMS allowed and the CPUs allowed in the status file. And also I was using PS rather than the top to get the CPU that it was running on. So I'm kind of done with that. Interrupts. Interrupts come in from all your different devices. Uh, tops are, there is an instat utility. It used to be a, a off script, but now it's a C program. And it's basically processing proc interrupts. Proc interrupts is too big to work with on past 64 CPUs, really a past 32 CPUs. So instat is something that is being integrated into performance suite, but it's in my shareware tool right now. Interrupts come in based upon where they're plugged into the fabric. So the way that this last site had placed their NICs round robin across I or U's, and then they wanted affinity to where those interrupts were coming in and where the data was coming in. Now, we do have something called SGI IRQ balancer that spreads interrupts across CPUs on the socket. Now, this is not used. It does not uh, run in a React situation only in a non-React, so React does something different. But this is trying to spread the interrupts across the CPUs on the socket rather than uh, pounding on one socket. My personal opinion, I always thought they should just direct the uh, interrupts to the virtuals, leave the virtuals for all the uh, miscellaneous 
uh, noise that doesn't that doesn't use floating points and caches. An interrupt handler doesn't is not cache intensive or functional unit intensive. Now interrupts can be redirected. I was doing this at Raytheon about a month ago. Uh, this is an IA64 path, but there is one for for normal now. And SAR will track your interrupt counts. And uh, this topology dash UV now has this dash AFF dash IO and dash IRQ options. So here's an example of proc interrupts. Each column is the CPU number. The first field here before the column is the IRQ number. Then we've got the number of interrupts. So I can see CPU 0 is getting the interrupts for this IRQ 0. Then we've got timer, we've got the this, this serial port, things of that sort. HBAs, IBs, all that sort of thing. And then here's what instats look like. Uh, this is a little bit old now, but here I can see my clock interrupts coming in. I know it's old because this is when the clock interrupts were at 1024 per second. Now they're down to 250 times a second. Now the, the instats that we have now, you can use a left arrow, right arrow to move to the right to the left. You can go up and down in it, and you can just kind of move around in these fields versus the wrapping type of problem you have here. And also, again, with the uh, topology, I can figure out the IRQ and just pull out the IRQ and watch a particular IRQ. Interesting, I am seeing this was run on a UV but I'm not sure why I'm getting 1024 clock interrupts per second. Not connecting to me. So I'm not sure what that timer is right now. The actual uh, clock interrupt that I was talking about is called LOC. Let me go back to my uh, desktop here. So now if you do it in, in, in stats, there's my timer. And here now I'm seeing what I expected. Nope. Oh, these are these are since this is a total, that's why. It's a running sum right now. Let me do an H. There is one to switch it here. Incremental, that's what I want, and a T. That explains what I was seeing. Now I got it. Snapshot in the workbook was doing a total, not a delta. You follow me? Mm hmm And I can so go right. I'm just using my right arrow here to look at everything. I'm going to go down. I'm at the end right now. I can see where my NICs are coming in. Things of that sort. One thing i got to check, I don't know what the difference between the 0, 1, 2, and 3s are. So these are receives and these are transmits. But I don't know what 1, 2, 3, and 4 have to do. I don't know the difference between those IRQs yet. Okay. After instats, what do we got here? Uh, this was a case, remember Jeff, when I had that context switch storm as soon as uh, SMC was loaded? So I'd actually collected data there where I was using PM chart to look at the interrupts. Be very careful of this, Thomas. The uh, SLES 11 base kernel has a bug when IPMI is loaded. And SMC was loading IPMI for sensor data for voltage, temperature, fan speeds. This was causing 10% system time on the SMN, driving context switches crazy, and high interrupts and high system time again. So the work the workaround or actually the fix was in a PTF2 kernel. But even on I even on Ice Jeff, I'm still seeing base slash eleven SP1 kernels that have this break in them and seeing system time there. So I I expect to see that problem float around for years. So the You're workaround is the be running a, a newer kernel, the update kernel or a PTF kernel, so that you don't get a context switch storm. Basically, I was able to see all 
All the system time was due to context switches. All the context switches were due to interrupts. Found that the interrupts were coming in on the serial port. Once I turned off IPMI, the interrupt stopped and everything behaved normal. So that did get fixed. Here is a topology command example. So here I'm able to see the blade location. I'm able to see the NAS ID. Look at, I've got NVIDIA's here, things like that. Here's an LSI. No, that's the onboard. Sorry, that's the onboard one. I'm able to see the NAS ID. I'm able to see the IRQ number, the CPU number, and the number of interrupts. So rather than trying to dig through that whole file, it's going to print out the, the total interrupts that have occurred for that IRQ. So this CPU 221 has gotten 26921 since boot. Now I'm not on large systems, I'm not seeing the CPU and the node IDs working correctly. I'm getting a lot of dashes in there. I've told the uh, uh, programmer about it, but I've not filed a bug, I don't think, because I can't prove anything yet. Every time I get on a customer system and see problems, I don't get help after I'm off the site and I can't get to the, the system to actually uh, get more diagnostics. And they're busy doing other things. But this is extremely useful. Let me share my desktop again. I think SSH deploy one. If you look, I created this cat pin. Uh, that's not the one I want, just cat pin IO. So what I was trying to do here was with XVM, figure out my preferred path. And then for that HBA, find that HBA in the topology. Grab the HBA, echo it. Ba basically, this would be the node number. If I looked at it, column five, get the node number, and then pin my process down to the node that had that HBA. Now they're doing this for uh, GPUs as well. In fact, that's why it was put into topology in the first place. But my question now is, uh, if I've got preferred paths that are, are, are staggered or rotated between IRUs, do I really need affinity since everything's going to be spread around anyways? But other people are looking at affinity issues as well. And a new product called the Path Manager is being looked at to deal with affinity. And there is an RFE in that area to, to deal with this affinity from XVM. Does that make sense? You see what I'm trying to do? Yep. Yep. Again, if spread slab and stuff like that, or if the cars are off on other IRUs, I'm not sure that I'm going to get the affinity I want. Let me go back to the workbook. Now, this, this, uh, these new options were added in January, but April has the latest version where, I, where they've added the uh, IO affinity information. So they were using it to grab the NAS ID and place things, you know, on the CPU for GPUs. And I was the one that came along and said, I want to be uh, affinity bound to the HBA. I want to be placed where the HBA is. But the memory spread slab and the memory spread cache are going to undo that affinity on me. IRQ redirection, so you can redirect IRQs. Uh, a year ago, the kernel had some bugs in this area. When I was at uh, a site recently that was React, the IRQ redirection coming from React was not correct. The IRQ by uh, this technique was, and I'm not going to demo this. So at this point, I, as far as I'm concerned, am done with slides. Any questions? So what I wanted to do was, I don't know if, I want to get off of Floyd 1. 
I don't know if you've got X11 on your desktop. And if I, I was, let me do this here. Oops, not the one I wanted. But I'm going to run PMG Sys. And this is going to tell me, again, this is a small system, but imagine having 40, 96 of these things. So it's showing me each of the CPUs, the load level, the network traffic, and on one side at Oak Ridge, I added, this is what I call a dashboard, and I added some speedometers there for the InfiniBand as well. And then I also added in some uh, speedometers here for memory on a per node basis. Okay. Uh, let me log in as an end user at this point. Thought that would have come up by now. There we are. So I have sys what happened here? Oh, I'm on the wrong system. SSH to uh Floyd two. Oops, I got in. Without a password, it looks like. That's okay. Get this up all open here. I'm going to go into my uh, SysA labs and then uh, real WL. So these are the programs I was using to stress things. I'm just going to run this. Let me do a module avail, module load Intel 11.1. And then run my code to MP. So this is a, a open MP multi-threaded application using dash parallel from the compiler. And notice it's hard to sort things out. Imagine 30 CPU sets and trying to use this tool to figure out what is what. CPU set dash Q. Let me do it again. Uh, so here is that CPU set script. Again, hard wall is zero, the spreads are one. And I'm looking at here, so Here's my worker thread. Here's the shepherd I was talking about, and I've not run D place. But look at the CPU placement now 31, 29, 28, 13, 5, 6, 6 twice. Not good. 4 twice. So the placement here is not clean. How many threads did I get there? PS dash. Uh, I need to use a capital T to go threads, M, E, grep for code, 2MP. Let's just it's see what we got there. Didn't catch them. It finished. Oh, okay, thank you. So let me try it again. T to C threads. Not giving me everything I want. Let's see here. Part of the problem is it doesn't always give the thread name. So if I do a T, uh, PS-ET, so there are the threads there. Now, cat slash proc slash dollar dollar slash CPU set, oops. And I see I'm in the boot CPU set here. 
But over here, this is where my work is running. Cat. And that's in the user CPU set. Okay? So this thing, first of all, I need to know how many threads I got here. Let me do this again. It is finished again. Thanks. Go to MP, pipe WC-L. So I've got 17 threads, but only 16 CPUs. But I've got that one that's a sleeper. Okay. Also, no PS is not giving me the uh, PID. Or I'm sorry, the job, ID, the processor number. So I'm going to do an export. Well, let me yeah do it there. Export uh, PS underscore personality equals IRIX. Now, if I do my PS dash ELT prep for code two MP. And this is what the script is doing. And now again, I can see the CPU numbers this way. 4, 5, 7, 22, 28. Not too bad placement, but it's really hard to try going through 512 of these to see how they're placed. 21. I don't see any overlapping, really. Not too bad. But again, there's no guarantee. If I cat slash proc slash, let's see. Two one, it's probably it's gone. finished. Yeah, it just finished. I wanted to look at the status file too. This time I'm going to do a D place dash X two dash C zero to fifteen. So even here, just because that's the current CPU is running on, doesn't mean the load balancer might not be thrashing it around and moving it around. So now I'm going to do it this way. Uh, what happened? Try it again. Okay, so I've got some problems going on here. I do know what's going on, I think. Let me see what top tells me. H to get the threads. You run it again. And I can see my CPUs, but again, I need H. All threads off. Threads back on again. Finished again. I can see up here I'm basically stuck on one CPU right now. So Jeff, you've been probably watching X86 apps. What was yeah. I suggesting? Uh, you need the KMP Infinity yep. Disable? Yep. Is that what it was? And I told Jim several times and, and John Wu several times, but the person that's doing it has still not come back on whether that was effective or not. This is an important one here, Thomas. People are getting bit by this. I've been bit by that one a few times already. Okay, okay. So, uh, Brady Petroleum is going through this right now, too. Uh, you also have this to be dynamic. Plus, I'm sorry, Intel 11 compiler was not a problem in Intel 10. So let's see if this is going to work now. I'm still not sure why I'm only getting two threads. There we go, three threads, four threads. Those are only for running. I can see all my CPUs are busy. Let me do a CPU set dash, capital Q. I need to get less verbose here. Can I come back already? No. What's OMP num thread set to? 
Uh, it's not set right now, but the libraries will set it to what's in the CPU set by default with 11. Okay. Intel 10, it did the whole system. And in, in my other class, I noticed you signed up for system analysis. We oversubscribe it and increase the OMNUM threads quite a bit to create barrier problems. Okay. But yes, I would be checking that. And it looks like I've got more than 16 threads here. And looking at the CPUs, notice it did four and then skipped and then five, six, seven, but then I got 12. I'm not sure if these are all the same. Let me do a kill all code to MP. There aren't any there. That's kind of interesting. I'm just wondering if they overlapped or whatever. Let me do what you were suggesting just to see right now. This should not be required. I have 16 CPUs in my CPU set. So now let me try the, and the affinity should still be set. Let me try this now. And let me see if I can catch it here. If you've got 16 CPUs in the CPU th uh, set and you've got... Um you got that dash C zero to fifteen on the D place. Isn't that a redundant? Um, it's it's not redundant because in this case you want to place them. You want to keep this those is giving a placement. On, this is setting an affinity. Their CPUs. Okay. That's giving the affinity. Okay. And if that's so not now again, it's hard to see because, of the, and that's why I wanted discontiguous and hyperthreads in here. Yeah, so 4 to 7 and 12 to 15 is is perfect. Yeah. Because there's 4, skip, 5, 6, 7, 12, 13, 15. Correct. Yeah, so it did exactly what you told it to do. Yes. And again, this is why the, with this script concept, I want to be able to see the CPU numbers up here. I'd like to compute the actual number of CPUs total in the CPU set and then the size of the memory nodes themselves as well. You both following what my, my thought process is here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So because of the complexity of these systems with interleaves and hyperthreads and stuff like that, I need to be able to know I'm trying to look at topology placement in a single snapshot. So here Jeff was pointing out we skipped the second one with a sh shepherd sleeper anyways, and we did a nice clean pin. Okay, but we don't have memory affinity and we don't have CPU affinity here either. You okay with that, Thomas? I think you are. Yeah. But it's really hard when I got 4096 and, and to be able to have something go 512 wide, I need a quick snapshot of all these threads and I don't want to have to pull them apart one by one. And I'd like to run the PS on each thread I'd like to run the get the MEMS allowed and CPUs allowed and get the DLOOP summary on each of the threads. That would be ideal. So I'm going to try it again. And this time I've got a dash V option. Now this is the one that's still broken, but I just want to see what it's got for me. So again, it's having problems finding the, the parent PID for the threads. It also finished again. Yeah. So here I can see my pages are spread round robin between node one and node three, which are the nodes in my CPU set, but I'm not able to get that affinity mask the way I want. So what do we got here? Parent PID, parent PID, spawned. Oh, see, I was trying to use this spawned PID. Let's see. There need to be one more field over. Well, anyways, I, I'm just trying to get this to work right and, and tweaking it. And then be able to see where the pages are. 
Now, I want to go one step further. NUMA CTL. I need to check the syntax here. Man, NUMA CTL. Now, this is why I was trying to do the interleaf just to see if I had problems here. So I've got a mem bind, and I want to bind them. Let me do this too before we do that. Let me go four threads wide. Let's see. Let me just go four threads wide. I was thinking eight. I'm trying to get it down to a socket rather than across two blades. And then do my NUMA CTL. Oh, wait a second. So I need uh, zero to three. Then my NUMA CTL dash dash membind. See, I used to think there was a, a shorter syntax for it, but dash dash membind. And then you have the ability, I'm not showing here, but you can do all, or there is a plus sign to indicate that you are logical within a CPU set. So I wanted to do a plus zero. Except the syntax is wrong. What did I do? So the the long the long arguments need an equal sign after them. There is a short argument of minus okay. M. Thanks. Re reading the Oh, mandate. I was trying to use the short argument versus the long, yeah. Let's try this. So there I am, and again with my CPU set, I'd like to actually be able to prove that they're actually on that particular socket. I'm not going to do that right now. Okay, CSA com dash n code two mp. Hmm, I'm down to eleven, actually twenty three seconds. So let's see here. So this is the actual run of that thing. One, two, three, four, five threads. Oh, wait a second, though. This is the wrong time of day. I hit a file system fault condition and corrupted my PX file. Okay. Let me try this again now. Oops, where was I? To exit back. Exit back. There you go. On the other window? <laughs> that one. Now, now you're back to being. There we are. We okay? Yep. Yep. Now I'm running again. Now, if I had PM Hub, I'd be able to see where the memory got allocated and be able to see this. Okay, so it's finished now. CSA com dash n. Code two MP. Oops, CSA com. And I'm down in the seven second range. Let me try it without the mem bind. Since I lost that data. And of course I'd be running this multiple times for a variance and a confidence interval. Looks like that one came in at seven seconds too. Okay, now let's see if I can actually do this quick enough here. D look dash summary. Let's just check the syntax. So I need no P, just the PID or the child. What if I do this?
node zero, node one, and node three. Looks like all my pages were on node one in this case. Looks like I got first touch is what I'm saying. Okay, so now at this point, you could push all your pages to node three and see how much you suffer from sure. having put the memory in the wrong place. Well, that's fine, good. And I've got uh, four nodes here, don't I? So no, let me go to well, one. Okay, but, but on the number of nodes that are in your CPU set, you have two. You have one and three. Okay. Yeah, I've only got two sockets right now. No, that's fine. So let me try it this way. And I'm still pinning on one. Oh, I didn't get the D looks. Oh, that didn't have the D look. Let me do it again. You can run CSA. Yeah, I know, but I wanted the D look summary too. Okay. Now here I don't. I wanted all this in D place so that I didn't have to do all this. But <laughs> D look dash summary. I think I put it in front of the Numa CTL. So let's see what this gives me. Oh. Now this is this is fascinating, Dave. Be, look look at the the graph. I know. It's, Up it's, here. Yeah, it, because because you had X two skipping. Uh huh. You you're gonna get terrible placement from a MP process because now you've got you X two'd, but the the second thing you skipped was the Numa CTL. So. Oh, my spawning order. Yeah, yeah, but it, it did the right. I mean, it did, it did you what know, you told it to do. Yeah, but like this. I say, knowing you, and I, I was worried about the order there. I agree, but everything did get placed on three, just out of curiosity. So the pinning didn't get them placed right either. There were probably two on the same, so the timing isn't going to be accurate here. So let's just see where we are. And that was in the thirty-second range. We were at nine seconds before, by the way, when I just placed it off off node. You okay with us, Thomas? Yep. So the spawning order is, is being skewed up now. So maybe you need to need to skip another thread. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Okay. Let me just see what we got going on here first. So this again is where CPU set yeah, dash capital Q. As a quick way of pulling this together, there's my four threads, 12, 6, 7, 4. I'm so not so sure why, because of the skip you said, the two. Well, so we yeah, needed so to know the spawning order more, right? But it's, it skips the CTEX one like you'd hope it would. It, it's funny, it went 6, 7, and then back down to 4. So all the pages are coming out of node 3. Yeah. Huh. And again, this is the hard part. Let me do a CSA com dash uh, U guest PS tree or something like that. So the D look dash summary is showing up in the spawning order. Yeah. So. And it's the last one to finish. Now I can put in PIDs here too. And this is the hard part, Jeff, I had when I had 128 of these things and to figure out the spawning order. Right. And of course, applications people don't want to go through all this work either. So. We have parent PID. You can see here the parent PID there for the five worker threads. So 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. So it looks like the first one. So I think I want a skip of a three. 
or no, I want to skip the first one and the third one. Five. Okay. Okay, that's what I'm thinking. So w w I didn't have CSA at the other site, but I'm starting off here, that's 92. Then I got 93 and then the sleeper. So I want to skip the first one and the third one. Okay. Yep. So that'd be five. Does that make sense? Yep, exactly. Yep. Now let's see if we can catch this here. So four, five, six, seven. Clean placement. Yep. CSA com dash N on code two MP just to see it. We're still in nine seconds because we're off node. Right. You okay with this, Jeff? So now let's put it back to zero. Yeah, this is cool. So uh, four, five, six, seven, everything's placed cleanly. D look is showing that my pages are on node one. Again, node zero is my boot CPU set. There are a couple of things here we don't we, we don't care. This vsys, vsys call, and there's another thing coming off of node zero, VDSO. Those are a don't care. I did have three, 31 pages on node three. We could go back and figure out what they are if I've got enough data here. I'm not able to find it easy enough. Let's see where we are, CSA com. Dash N code two MP seven seconds. Is that proof of concept for you, Jeff? That's really slick. But the problem now is if I'm going past a socket, I don't have a way of making sure thread groups are going to be on the same, you know, affinity to the socket. So Numa CTL is saying use this pool, but it's not saying this thread on this socket. D place is saying this thread on this core or this CPU, but there's nothing there to say put this stuff on this particular socket. So that's why I dropped it down to four threads. Mm -hmm. But we go, uh, let's try eight threads and try to get them on the same socket. Well, first of all, I need to do my export. So I was avoiding the hyper threads before. Right. So now what do I need here? Comma. Zero to seven. No. No. Yes. You want eight wide. Uh, and you want the first you want the first eight, so it's zero to seven. Well I want them on, on the same socket. And the second socket was here, so I want four to seven, and, 20, and then twenty to twenty-three. Okay, so now now you want to put them on the on the hyper threads, okay? So I'm, and this is the hard part now to try to get it down to that socket, because within the CPU set, what's it going to do? Now we're going to uh, let's run it your way first, zero to seven, and then see right. where they come out. Yeah. Okay. So and we'll be able to actually see the physical CPUs then. Right. And okay. now, now your, now now your mem bind is bad because now you're going to stuff everything onto the first mem. But I'm trying to get the really CPUs want... that are on that same mem bind socket zero. And again, that's relative the plus sign. Right. So um, the question is, are these the the logical CPUs that are on that socket? And I'm thinking it's going to go. Uh, where were we? Four, five, six, seven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Yes. And do the physicals, you know, go by numbering first. Right. So now, right half here. your memory. I'm thinking it's going to go like this. Right. Yeah. And so now half your memory placement would be poor because Correct. you're binding into the first socket, but you're going Correct. to go over both. Because I'm, I'm not socket boundary bound right now, right. I don't think, because these are relative. And this is where I was actually using physical rather than 
logical for a while. But let's see what happens here. Let him up. So where the CPUs come out at. And this this again is why I would have a hard copy next to me. Four, five, six, seven, then twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Yep. Are those on the same socket? No. That means you, you went you went on you went on the two sockets. Correct. That's what I was expecting. That's why when you said make them uh, contiguous, I said, but the virtuals are the higher numbers. Right. Well, I've got, I've got to quite understand what you wanted to do. So, yeah, okay, great. You following what I was trying to say? Oh, yeah. Now, imagine a programmer trying to figure this out. So that one was at 22 seconds. But, again, I can't compare it to the other because we're eight threads wide instead of four threads wide. So I can't use the seven-second baseline. Right. But now you can t now you could take off the the, the mem bond, Correct. or go the other way, which is what you want to do. Yeah. Zero to three, and then what was the other one going to be? Uh, you want to start at eight? I got to skip at four. Zero three. You're going to start at yep. eight. Eight to eleven. Yep. And that should put them all on the same socket. Now, when so now PM Hub is available, it will show on a socket basis. And take care of this for me. That's right. the now, now you'll see the threads in the in the PMG sys stack. So go ahead and run this. Yeah. Because now the threads will in the PMG sys stack will be right above each other because that's the way they're ordered, just in the display. Just the way it's packed in the display. Yeah. And now you got 21. Yep. Okay. So pages are all on node one. I'm able to see the CPUs they were on because I snapshotted it quick enough. Four, five, six, seven, 20 through. And then again, I like to have a hard copy of CPU map next to me. Right. Particularly when it's a large CPU count to make sure that I am now uh, socket boundary aware. And I was trying to do four through seven and 20 through 23, right? Right. And you got those. Yep. Let's see what our timing was. Again, we can't compare it to the seven, nine seconds because we went more threads wide. But we were at 22 seconds before. Oh, we're down to nine seconds from 22, it looks like. And even though you're using those terrible, awful, disgusting hyper threads, you beat the 11 snot out of using all of the real threads because you had memory locality. Uh-huh. I'm kind of done with this experiment. Yeah, this is cool. This is very nice. But you can see why I was trying to get the CPU set Q thing to make it easier to pull it apart and examine on a per CPU set basis. And I had a third argument that would be like the CPU set name. So again, I wanted to do something at CPU set dash cap Q dash V and then the name of the CPU set. Except in this case, it's not right. But and then be able to look at a given CPU set. Any questions there, Thomas? To me, that's quite a bit of difference from 22 seconds down to nine, and then cutting the thread in half and just staying everything on socket without using hyper threads down to seven seconds. That's still a 20, 30% improvement. But I got to warn you, the code to MP is not optimized for multi-threading. It has both barrier problems and fault sharing problems, and I need I would need to profile that nine seconds with PS Run to confirm more. But I got a 50% degradation by improper uh, placement, shall we say? And and we were still staying on board. We were still staying, you know, on board. We weren't going okay. across. The topology. We weren't going off board in this example. And, and the one other thing you might do is to, is to not use the NUMA CTL specification and see, okay, what is my performance like if I don't bind the memory? No, I don't think that's going to affect our placement. It was D look that I was seeing before. 
the DLOOP summary? Yeah, I so think I'm you're right. Still leave the five there. Yep. But I don't know till I'm done. <laughs> Oh, what the heck happened? I got a whole bunch of code to MPs, it looks like. I don't know if my thread width changed. No. It's... Or what else? What, well, watching it run, it only it only ran on the CPUs you wanted it to run on. That doesn't tell, tell you about yeah. you know, my code thread number, but. I'm looking at PIDs over here. I'm wondering if I had two running at the same time or something. There are multiple DLOOKs. Is anybody else doing this too? No. No. Run, run CSA.com. See how sure. many reports. Now, Tom, is CSA uh, accounting was uh, drop support a year ago, but it's still open source and I still use it. Okay. And a lot right. of us want it back. We have RFP, RFPs that need it. So, anyways, so we're in still the, in the nine second range. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so that makes sense, Dave. You only got yeah at at, at twelve fifty three. You only got the you got the number you're expecting. Yeah, maybe maybe my script is screwed up and what it printed out. I seem to get recursive stuff. Let's just try that again. Let me just make sure it's clean here first. Okay. Had you left o OMP num threads increase from the previous example? We only we moved it up to eight, but I can do okay. that here. Export, and that's what was concerning me. Okay. okay. So I was just going to try the same thing again. And we're basically doing it out without the NUMA placement. Okay. So we should definitely only see eight threads this time. Plus the watch thread, right? Yeah, right. My script's got something wrong with it. This has got to be my script. It's recursively doing stuff. It looks like, yeah, do you have PIDs that are repeating there? Yeah. Like I say, I was just, I started hacking this together about a week ago. The verb the anyway. And all the pages were on socket one, but again we were trying to stay on socket for everything. Yeah. But I, I've kind of beat this into the ground at this point. We helped. We helped. <laughs> now Code 703, node info. I'm writing dirty data, and I can see it, it's only staying within the CPU set. I was expecting to see it get across everything. A year ago, it was spreading across everything. I'm going to pound on the slab for metadata. And we can see the slab is growing. I'm not going to count zero. But you can see the uh, one and three are growing in the slab. And this blade that I've completely ignored has nothing going on with it. So my I.O. is being contained within that CPU set. That's not what I was expecting. So what, what are the values then of sure. the spreads? So this will be, let's just look at all of them first. Dev CPU set, right. cat spread, they're both one, and cat hard wall, and that's a zero. Now, SGI sets the spreads to a one from that boot.cpuset spread memory script. Okay. 
And let me do a check. Config boot dot CPU set underscore memory underscore spread. Oops. It has a have memory with a P in it. Uh, pretty poor. There we are, and it's on right now. Okay. Now let's go into the user CPU set. Cap the uh, spreads, and they're set to one. Cap the hard wall, and that's set to a zero. So I'm going to echo a one into mem underscore hard wall. Now this is why I think things aren't working, because of the way it behaved a year ago. And I have a long email discussion with both Hetty and Alexis about this, and uh, was complaining a year ago that the behavior flipped or defaulted. In 10, you were contained in the CPU set. A year ago, you were able to do slab and page cache outside the CPU set, and I was complaining about the default changing, the behavior changing. And look at the documentation for it. And it looks to me like it's behaving like mem hardwall is set to a one, even though it shows a zero. Uh, I'm not sure I want to do a sync right now. Oh, it came back quick enough. Node info. And it's staying within the CPU set still. Okay. Now I'm going to turn off the spread. First of all, let me do a BC free dash A. Oh, I'm not root there. BC3 came back already. Dirties are clean. Slabs are pretty clean. Okay, so now he's going to uh, echo a zero into uh, memory underscore spread underscore page and slab. Now, I'm not trying to do any I.O. bandwidth quality of service measurement here. I'm just looking at the behavior. So I'm not trying to prove that affinity on I.O. can make a big difference in the I.O. bandwidth or I.O. wait times. That's not part of what I'm trying to do here. I don't have a predictable experiment for that. Let's see. So let's just see where this comes up. Again, I would like to see Node info have an option to say node info name of the CPU set and only print out the nodes that are in that CPU set. Trying to work with this on 128 nodes and they're sorted by numerical, so it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then it, it, it jumps to like 20 instead of 10 and stuff. So 20, 30, 40, it was, it was not a normal node sequence. And just like we were talking about the interleaving up here, it was hard to sort things out in node info. And we can see it's all on one node. I didn't do any pinning or anything. I let it pin on its own. Okay. And then let me just try the slab. And then I'm, I think I'm pretty much done unless there's something that you want to do ask about too. Now in this case, oh, I, I guess I sh I'm spawning it across, I'm, I'm spawning a lot of these. There's multiple ones and I'm not necessarily pinning them compared to before. But you're still inside your CPU set. Yes, but the spread, I'm not going to see the effect of the spread because I haven't put all the multiple code fives I'm running oh, on the it. same CPU. Let me let me modify this. Ooh, a little slow here. 
contention on my slab. Oh, it already came up now. Okay. So let me just do a D place here. There's no affinity or anything like that. No, I mean, no skip knees here. So let me just put CPU zero, put them all on the same. Actually, let's put it zero to three. Okay. And I'm going to change the number of concurrent copies. And I am still feeling the impact here. PS correct for VI. BT on. 25695. Of course, it came back. It looks like. Let's just see where we are here. So there's nothing special there. That's a wake up. But now, the next time I get a stall, I'll be. I'll have it ready here. In fact, let me up arrow here. Okay. Oops. Look at that one. We're in metadata. I'm still waiting to get out. It's still trying to get out. My VI is still stuck. Looks like I'm in unlinked this time. But basically, again, remember there's backup files and stuff like that. But that, all that VI was stalling on the metadata on the slab. And I'm doing that because of the unlink and the path lookup, user path lookup. This stuff here, and it's going to NFS in this case too, by the way. And that's the Radix tree? Yes. But okay. I was just saying, because the network select, uh, I thought I had another one here. Nope, I guess not. Yeah, there was the one. So I happened to catch threes, but here was an F stat and a path lookup on the second one. And then an unlink on the third one. So all those VIs, when I happened to snapshot the backtrace, this was the first one, which was the generic. This, this was the one when it was clean and behaving okay. And then I had a stall, and here we're doing a path lookup, which means we're going into the slab to find things. And then the last stall, we were trying to unlink it. Again, metadata. You okay with that, uh, Thomas? Yep. So let's just see what happens here now. Oops. I've had numerous times where I've caught things from experiments like this where spreads aren't working, and right now I think Mem Hardwall isn't working. Uh, let's see. I've got a low disk space warning up there, too. So I can see the slab is on node one. We okay? I think I'm done. Okay. Okay. Now you can use these systems even through the weekend if you're interested. Monday morning I will be rebuilding them in class next week, uh, running a Red Hat admin class next week. So uh, I'm going to declare launch. It's going to be up to you how you manage. You know, it's a Friday. It's up to you how much you want to try to proof of concept any of the things that I did here or follow up on the labs. Uh, Jeff knows me quite well, but Thomas, these machines are reservable in the future if there's no class going on. Okay. I can set, you know, set up a route for you and that sort of thing and support you if you need to come back to anything. Okay. Anything well, else? Thanks. Uh, no, thanks, Dave. Um, Really so I sent an really email for an eval there, and okay. uh, uh, 
uh, again, you can send me email if there's anything that you want to ask about. I always tell people, send me email and I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll say that's a support issue. You got to go to uh, the call center or go to the x86 apps. But if it's something simple that's uh, information based that's in my manuals and stuff, I'll directly answer that. So, you all have a good uh, weekend. I again will be online, uh, available for any uh, lab issues. <laughs>